What's going on everybody, it's Andy the Mad Tatter and welcome back to the channel for attempt three at making this video. Uh, yes, so first of all, I want to apologise for not being in the loop very much uh, over the sort of course of the new year. Uh, the last video you saw from me was the 19 questions video and uh, I've not done any sort of sales roundup or anything for January or December yet. Uh, reason being... Obviously, January, uh, well, December and January, particularly busy months anyway, uh, but also there was a lot of illness and stuff kicking around in January, so I didn't get a huge amount done in terms of wanting to sit down in front of a camera and be able to prattle on uh, at, for an hour or so like I normally do. So, uh, yeah, I, I've kind of just had to sort of knock it on the head a little bit for, for, for that period of time, just while I got over all that. Um, didn't stop working, of course, carried on buying stuff, carried on selling stuff, carried on posting stuff, uh, but it was just the whole sort of being able to sit down and talk to a camera without coughing my guts up was, uh, you know, proving difficult. So, uh, hence why I've not been around, do apologise for that, but back now, and back with what is the first video of 2020 on the 4th of February. And it's actually, the, as I say, the third attempt at trying to make this video. The first attempt sounded terrible, uh, because the uh, forward-facing camera on my phone, the microphone's not particularly good, so I've had to put some sheets and stuff behind the camera to stop it from echoing. Uh, I also looked like I was being held hostage somewhere because I had it so badly lit that I just kind of looked really gaunt and even more pale and washed out than I do now. Uh, so that was first attempt. Second attempt that I've just tried recording about five minutes ago, uh, I got to less than 10% of storage remaining on my phone, so I had to go and sort of wipe a load of stuff off my phone as well. So this is attempt three. Uh, let's see if we can actually get there and get through the video this time. First of all, just to mention, uh, last week I joined the Instagram generation. Uh, the main motivation for doing that was to give you all, if you need or want an avenue to contact me by, and you don't want to necessarily leave a comment in a YouTube video, a public comment or anything like that, because YouTube doesn't have any, uh, you know, system in there to message each other or anything. Uh, for creators to message their, you know, to, to message their uh, audience or for, you know, creators to message each other or anything like that. It doesn't exist in YouTube, so I thought Instagram was probably the easiest angle to go for on that one uh it seems to have the most people using it these days and it doesn't have all of the sort of distracting and frustrating elements of facebook that come along with that so uh on instagram now uh the instagram name is the mad tatagram which i will try and line up with my fingers there when i put it on and say you know make it look classy it probably won't because you know what i'm like um but yeah so the Mad Tatagram, do feel free to follow me. It's a public account. Anybody can follow me. Anybody can message me. No problem at all. Uh, you know, whether it's about reselling, whether it's about whatever. So, yeah, give us a follow on there and uh, feel free to message me anytime you like and interact with the stuff on there. Uh, okay, so this video... This video is going to be a little bit of a haul video and also just a little bit of a general catch-up video because I'll probably chat to you about other things as we go along as well. Uh, it's going to be from a lot of the items that I've bought throughout January and the first few days of February. Because uh, as I say, although I've been out of action from YouTube, I haven't been out of action from business and from work generally. Uh, that's always going to carry on. So I, uh, I've spent probably getting on for the thick end of a grand uh, between January and the first few days of February now. I think it's around about sort of... I want to say it's about 870 quid or something like that. So best part of a grand, definitely. Um, but it's stands to net me probably around about seven to eight thousand uh, pounds in terms of resale value uh, so it's a pretty good haul uh, I'm not going to show you everything because we'd be here for days uh, but I am going to show you some of the highlights of some of the things that I've picked up over the past couple, past month or so and I'm also going to sort of tell you a little bit about my motivation for picking them up, what I look for in these types of items. I'm not going to go deliberately uh, too much into detail on pricing. Now, the reason I don't do that on haul videos, and if you look back at any of the previous haul videos that I did, you know, months ago now, um, they tend to be a total, uh, a total spent and a total that I expect to realise. I don't really go into prices specifically on the items. Now, the reason for that, I have absolutely nothing against anybody who does do a haul video that way. It's fair enough. But I pitch this channel much more towards new resellers or to people that want to get into doing this or have a, a little idea that they, you know, they want to try doing this. And the reason that I don't want to turn around to them and say, I've bought it for this, I'm going to sell it for that, or I'm going to list it for that. Excuse me is simply because it can appear speculative, especially to new people. You know, um, I remember when I first started watching sort of reselling YouTube videos, I, since I tended to think, well, yeah, it's all very well and good saying you're going to list it for that, but what are you actually going to sell it for? So 
with that in mind, and as I say, I have no problem with people doing sales roundup videos however they want. There's definitely a place for lots of different approaches, but this is the reason I do my approach the way I do. With my sales roundup videos, when you see what has actually sold, you will get a full breakdown of my experience with that item. So I'll tell you how much it cost, any associated costs that that item had in terms of being prepped for sale, um, what the item sold for, how much profit was made, any you know salient information that I picked up along the way, uh, or any sort of you know hiccups or whatever, I can tell you all of that after an item is sold, and it will be absolute. Whereas telling it you before the fact uh, or explaining these things before the fact can sometimes come across as a little bit speculative. So because I don't want to come across that way, and because this is why my videos are titled the way they're titled as well. If you look at my haul videos, they're always called "What to Sell on eBay," uh, and my sales roundup videos are always called what sold on ebay or what sells on ebay so it's kind of um you know i, th I think the haul videos are there for people wondering what they can sell um and the sales roundup videos are there sort of for people to be able to go yeah that definitely does sell so you know i, I kind of want to give both sides of the coin uh, a little bit as well in that respect but haul videos are not something that uh, i've put out loads of but i could change that now you know i've got a little bit more time to devote to youtube now uh, i've actually been able to earmark, earmark a day once a fortnight to be able to sit down and make videos so uh, i should be able to do some more content and some different content as well with any luck also uh, going to look into seeing what the camera and microphone and stuff is like on my laptop uh, and if that is uh, up to a sufficiently reasonable standard then I should be able to start doing some lives and stuff as well where people can get directly involved. So uh, with all of that kind of little bit of preamble said um, we'll get into some of the items. Uh, as I say there's a bit of everything here, uh, loads of different stuff, you know obviously some of my usual bread and butter stuff as well. Um, Excuse me. So we're going to start with something quite simple. And this is a great way, uh, again, from the perspective of a new reseller or from the perspective of somebody who's thinking about perhaps trying reselling or getting into it. Uh, it's something that a lot of people may have around their house anyway. Uh, but even if you don't, it's something that you can pick up relatively cheaply and quite often sell for decent money. So it's a pennies and a pounds kind of item. And they're quite sort of prevalent as well. I'm talking about VHS cassettes. Big shout out to Rob, the Aussie VHS thrifter. Link down below to his channel. Um, Rob is an absolutely uh, honest, genuine, straightforward guy. Uh, doesn't pull any punches with what he says. I have shouted him out in a video before, but as we're talking specifically about VHS, he's getting another one. Um, yeah, he knows his VHS, he knows what sells, he knows what doesn't sell, and he isn't afraid to tell it you in a way that, you know, is, is straightforward and to the point. He's not going to pull any punches. Um, so I have picked up a few videos in the past. Uh, I've picked up a load of Disney ones that, you know, yeah, don't believe the hype with Disney videos. They're not as good as people say they are, unless you get certain editions, of course. Um, but the thing that I've personally had the most success with in terms of uh, video cassettes is music. Uh, music videos, music performances, live recordings, things like that. Um, I've done all right with those and I have sort of turned, you know, items that have cost me 50p to a pound into sales of, you know, 15 to 20 quid. So it's not a huge sale amount, but uh, there's a it's a good profit on a small investment. And if you're just starting out, it is a great way to sort of start building a little bit of a pool of money that you can then build that snowball uh, of and, and reinvest into other stock. So what I've got here... Um, as I've said in a previous video, I was in a rock band for for uh, about six years, um, so I've always been kind of surrounded by rock music uh, and and been had had one foot in that world to a certain extent. Uh, so I know artists that are popular in in uh, certainly in like classic rock and stuff like that as well. So. Um, the, the videos I've picked up here, uh, these videos were a Harry Potter, so they were a quid each in total. And we've got three uh, Neil Young and Crazy Horse videos. Uh, Neil Young as well as being, you know, a uh, prolific singer uh, and artist is also a prolific songwriter for other artists and stuff as well. So you'll see Neil Young's name all over the place in sort of 70s, 80s, 90s rock music. Uh, so we've got three Neil Young and Crazy Horse videos and a Peter Gabriel as well. Uh, as I say, these cost me a pound each and the Peter Gabriel ones, uh, sorry, the 
Neil Young ones, should I say. That set is probably going to go for around about 30 to 35 quid. So again, it's not a massive sale item. You know, we're not, I'm not saying I've paid a three quid for these and I'm going to list them and sell them for 500 quid. Not the case, but a nice little easy flip that's very easy to deal with as well. Um, you know, they're all they're almost already pre-packaged for you. The video cases are really hard. So the chances of that coming to any sort of damage or anything in the post are slim to none. Uh, minimal amount of packaging needed on them. So really good from that perspective too. A great starter item uh, and something that you can find quite readily. Uh, you'll either have them probably in your home already from years ago, or if not, you'll definitely always find them in your sort of charity shops, secondhand shops, thrift shops, what, op shops, whatever you call them, uh, or at your car boots, markets, you know, swap meets, that type of thing. So videos, great shout. And from my experience, um, music videos have done particularly well. Uh, it's no real secret amongst reselling, amongst resellers and reselling community in general that uh, horror VHS is the most profitable sort of uh, avenue for VHS as a rule. Uh, but anything, particularly if it's in the what they call the clamshell uh, video cases, which are the sort of bigger... Um, so if you look at this video case, there's not really much overlap of the actual sort of lip of the lid there doesn't overlap a great deal to the edge of the case so with the clamshell ones what you'll tend to find is that lip protrudes slightly further and the cases generally have a bit of a sort of semi squidgy feel to them is the best way I can describe it. If you, you'll, you'll see pictures of him. If you look on Rob's channel, he gets a lot of, you know, he's, he's like the clamshell king in terms of these video uh, cases and stuff. So you'll definitely see them on there. And it's it's like the old X-Rental videos and stuff like that used to come in those type of boxes. So they tend to be the ones that command the most money, regardless of, you know, what sort of genre they are. But in terms of a genre, if you like, um, yeah, definitely horror is the one to look for. But from my experience, I've done all right with music as well. So that was my first little item. Then we'll go through a few pairs of loose shoes. In fact, yeah, I've got some boxed ones in here as well. So first ones we've got, I actually picked these up on Sunday. Uh, these are a pair of Rocket Dog uh, canvas, sort of converse style uh, baseball shoes, pumps. Uh, stripey canvas pattern to them. Uh, I hear that stripes are going to be quite a big uh, trend in 2020, so definitely be looking out for uh, for stripey stuff, stripey shirts, uh, and that sort of thing as well. If you're dealing in the clothing, don't hold me to this. It is just a kind of um, anecdotal thing that I've heard that that they are potentially tipped to be big for 2020. Rocket Dog, uh, I've spoken about as a brand before. Uh, they do suffer a little bit from what I call Converse Syndrome. Now, Converse Syndrome, from my perspective, is the devaluing of a product because of it, its availability in uh, discount stores. So with Converse shoes particularly, what you find is that the likes of uh, TK Maxx or TJ Maxx, depending on where you are in the world, um, they sell a lot of Converse shoes. And what I found that has done has dented significantly dented the uh, resale market or certainly the resale potential of some of the standard Converse shoes. So when you look at the Converse, that are, you know, this kind of configuration with the, the canvas, uh, the canvas uppers and, you know, just a standard sole on them and stuff like that, I, it's almost a case of they're not worth uh, people buying them secondhand because they can get them so cheaply new. Now that's certainly the case from my experience in the UK. Um, these things are quite cheap to pick up new, so I don't always pick them up secondhand unless they are particularly cheap. Now Rocket Dog also has a little bit of that kind of uh, problem that they are quite readily available in discount stores and stuff like that. So don't pick them up for too much money. Um, but these I picked up quite cheaply. Uh, as I say, the style is hopefully, from what I've heard, going to be bang on trend for 2020. Uh, the classic Rocket Dog sole there with the bright orange and the purple text. The condition on these is superb. They don't look like they've ever been worn. Uh, or they've got a little bit of dirt. They're just slightly dusty on the front of the toe there. Uh, but that is literally dust and that'll just pull out. So, uh, yeah, they have been worn, but they've not had any significant wear whatsoever. They've probably been worn once and then, you know, oh, I don't like them, but I can't take them back now type of arrangement. So, um, yeah, so they were a good little pickup. 
certainly the style certainly style wise they look good um and as i say the brand is popular uh you know I, i've had a few different bits and pieces of rocket dog that i've still sold uh it tends to sell reasonably quickly uh but as i say you're not always going to make massive profits on it unless you pick stuff up particularly cheap to begin with so they can go in the i've talked about that box next for a pair of loose shoes we've got these uh excuse me these are by tuk uh, these are sort of suede and rubber with a bit of uh, fake fur zebra trim on them. Uh, these are like a brothel creeper type design. Uh, I don't know if you can even call them brothel creepers anymore. I get in trouble for listing them as brothel creepers on YouTube, or do we call them something a bit more PC these days? I know they used to be called brothel creepers back in the day because you, you never used to be able to hear the, you know, the idea was you never used to be able to hear your fella sneaking out of the house to go and see his bit of stuff down the brothel. Um, but you probably don't call them that anymore. I don't know what they do call them. I'll have to look into that. Uh, but yeah, they've got the big, thick, sort of uh, rubber, crepey type sole. Nice suede upper on them. Uh, a really cool sort of rockabilly or goth type style to these. Uh, again, sort of being around the rock music and stuff like that for a lot of years, you tend to see a lot of the fashions for, from that kind of uh, that kind of subculture and stuff as well. So I don't think I'm going to have any trouble selling these at all. Uh, I think they'll probably will sell re reasonably quickly as well. Uh, the condition's great on them. Again, don't look to have had too much wear. Um, and in just overall pretty good condition. I checked the comps on these in the shop when I picked them up. Excuse me, because as I say, I'd never heard of the brand before. So when I've never heard of a brand, I'll always check it out first. Um, but... I could tell that they were quality, you know, straight away you can kind of feel the quality on them. You can see the little details and stuff like that, things like the, how, uh, I don't know if this will actually pick up on the camera or not, but things like how uh, sharp the stitching is and how regular the stitching is, uh, certainly around things like, you know, the lace loops and stuff like that as well. All of the stitching is really good and that's a great indication of a quality product. Uh, similarly, what you've got is uh, the soles glued, to the upper but it's also stitched so it's kind of a double uh a, a kind of a, a double method of attachment so again that's kind of an indicator of a quality piece of footwear uh this tuk brand do also from from what i found uh looking doing a bit of research they do sell a lot of vegan footwear as well although obviously that's not the case with these because they do have a suede upper so those are quite cool something a little bit different in style um pitched at a very different market than some of the other stuff that I tend to sell, like the designer gear and stuff like that. This is a little bit more of an alternative uh, sort of subculture that these will go towards. But again, I don't think they're going to sit around for too long, uh, especially in that colour as well. That bright red's really sort of striking uh, with the with the kind of uh, zebra print on them as well. They look awesome. So that was those. These, I couldn't believe the condition I picked up uh, these in. This is a pair of uh, Adidas Adizero Boston men's trainers. Now, they don't look to me like they've ever been worn at all. There's no crease into the toe box. There's no sort of edge wear to the lip around the heel or the toe or around the instep or anything like that. These are in superb condition. Now, whether you necessarily know about some of these trainers or not, before you pick them up. If you know about other things and other consumer products in the world, sometimes you can have a bit of a clue as to whether you're dealing with a decent pair of trainers or not. So of course, everybody knows uh, from Adidas, everybody knows things like the Yeezys and stuff like that that go for crazy money, but there's millions of fakes of them out there and they're not even really that nice looking of a shoe, I don't personally think. Um, so they can be a bit of a minefield. Uh, but when you look at something like this, more of a kind of core Adidas range product. A good little giveaway of a quality, of a similar quality on it is the Continental Rubber Sole. Now this is where I say a bit of knowledge about other consumer products comes in. Continental are famous for making high quality uh, car tires, racing tires and things like that. Um, but also sort of general rubber manufacture for other industries and stuff as well. So the fact that these have a Continental Sole on the Adidas trainers indicates that they're a little bit of a cut above the sort of standard, you know, run-of-the-mill stuff. Um, 
as I say, condition is immaculate on these, and yeah, brilliant. They're a nice colorway. They're not too sort of loud, although they do have some nice details on them that just gives it a little bit of pop. Uh, but I will tell you exactly what I paid for these, actually, because I'm quite ch chuffed with them for the uh, money that I paid. I paid £5.75 for those, and they're practically brand new. I haven't looked them up or anything yet to check them for, uh, you know, for a listing price or anything, so I can't say, you know, I can't speculate what I'm going to list them for, but at £5.75, I, they they will absolutely smash it, and they're a great pair of shoes as well. So that's the Adidas uh, Adi Zero Boston men's trainers. Then we've got all right. Let's go with something slightly different. We've got a big uh, Disney Parks. Uh, this is from Walt Disney World, as opposed to Disneyland Paris or any of the other ones. So this would be Florida, I think, isn't it? Um, this is the Main Street Fire Department. Uh, number 70 engine number 71 uh, plush fire engine toy it's reasonably big as you can see there next to my big meathead um, it's you've got Mickey uh, as the fire chief then you've got Goofy uh, <laughs> Donald mugging it out the back there and Pluto as the sort of fire station dog with the bucket in his mouth. So there's quite a lot of nice little details on this. It's rigid across the bottom as well, so there's some sort of board in there so that when it's on display. So this is definitely like a display plush as opposed to like a you know a kid's cuddly toy sort of thing. It's definitely a display item. Um I picked this up because it's really different. I have kind of slowed down a lot with plush stuff uh in recent months and re you know, uh, just because I've done I've got quite a few of them still from when I first started out, uh, but I've kind of evolved into other things where I can spend the same sort of money that I would have spent on a plush previously, but make more on a different product. So I tend to evolve, I, I tend to sort of move around a little bit, but I will still pick up plushes if they're in you know, if there's something a little bit different, if they're in particularly good condition or there's something that I know to be rare. Um, so I picked this up because it is in that kind of, it's a bit different and it's quite a big plush thing as well. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, with the Disney stuff, the Disney parks stuff and the Disney World stuff, things like that, uh, tends to command a little bit more money just because it is that little bit more exclusive to the parks rather than just being something you could go and pick up at like a Disney store or a licensed product from a department store or something like that. So that is the Disney plush uh, Main Street Fire Department fire engine. With my head in the middle of it. There we go. A uh, couple of other little cheapy bits. These were pickups from a car boot the other day, but again, um, sort of cheap, easy, quick flips. Uh, well, not necessarily quick. I won't lie there. I'm not going to say that some of these things are going to flip quickly, but you'll have so little money tied up in certain things that you can often afford to just kind of sit, sort of suck it and see and see how long it takes for these things to go. Um, this is a case in point. These are two uh, Panasonic DVC digital video cassettes for a digital video camcorder. Uh, 90 minute cassettes which can also run uh, on standard play to 60 minutes. So uh, these, again I'll tell you the price on these because it, if you're looking for this sort of thing I can sort of say yeah, you know. Um, 50p each I paid for these. They are factory sealed, brand new and factory sealed and these have sold very consistently on eBay for about a fiver each. So again, it's kind of 10 times return on your money. Um, it's not a massive profit item. Well, it's, it's a good profit against 50p, but it's not something that you're necessarily going to sort of make your retirement fund out of selling. But they are great little items to just kind of keep things ticking over uh, and keep sales trickling through. Uh, so that's the same for any sort of blank media as well. The more obscure, the better, I think, sometimes. So if you get things like the... Um, you know, VHS C cassettes and stuff like that for older camcorders. People are still using these things, and I've sold a lot of, of older camcorders myself in the past. And uh, you know, they, they sell very quickly, so people are still out there using older camcorders. If you find older camcorder cassettes out there, and they're only sort of fifty p to a pound, definitely pick them up because you will always sell them. Um, with stuff like this, um, and some of the other stuff that I'm going to talk about as well. You will often find that it will only sell when people need it. It's not very much of a want item, it's a need item. So be prepared that you might have to sit on certain things for a little bit longer. Uh, but when, like I say, when you have a very small amount of money tied up in something, you can almost sit on it indefinitely. Uh, certainly to begin with, you can almost sit on it indefinitely um, and just, just build up the experience of having sold that item so that you then know in future whether you can sell that item again or not. Um, 
there's a thousand and one different uh, factors and different reasons as to why some people can sell items and some people can't. You know, you could list the same item as me and you could sell it tomorrow. I could have it for six months or vice versa. Um, there's a lot of different factors in play there. So when you're learning, um, and it's certainly if you're out there sort of doing it on your own and stuff like that, when you're learning, picking up small, cheap items to start with and just kind of seeing if you can roll those is a great way to go. And these are great examples of such small, cheap items, as is this one, which is the Oxford Z2A of uh, Sport. This is an eight disc CD set and it's just kind of... Uh, audio recordings of uh, sort of lectures and uh, commentaries, interviews and stuff like that with sports people uh, that have come from Oxford University over the years. So uh, this was only, again, I'll tell you the price on this one, it was only a pound of a pickup, might go for about a tenner, something along those sort of lines. Uh, again, that is a little bit speculative and I did say I wouldn't do that, but I kind of fallen into doing it somehow. Um, yeah, not a massive profit item but again something that was just kind of an in i picked this up because it's an interesting little pickup and i just want to see if it does sell at a pound uh but if you were picking this up when you're just starting out this could potentially be the difference between you know having a, an extra tenner to spend on some stock down the line or not so you know definitely look out for things where they're branded uh from a, the educational resources or they're branded from a university or something along those sort of lines as well because they can quite often have a bit of, of a bit of a following and a bit of demand for that reason so that's a couple of little media bits uh another one that i picked up at the car boot on sunday was this uh samsung uh, VG STC 4000. I'll show you the label there. So if it focuses at all, it probably won't because this camera, this front-facing camera, is bobbins. Um, yeah, it's a Samsung camera for your smart TV. So it hooks over your TV. And then you've got a little uh, microphone and stuff built into it there as well. It's also got a little privacy screen. So if you're worried about your TV spying on you, you can flick that over there. And uh, yeah, peripherals, things like that, particularly for sort of newer technology like the TVs and stuff, if it's something that's ridiculously expensive to buy new and you can pick one up in good condition secondhand, absolutely go for it. Uh, the same for peripherals with anything like remote, uh, remote controls. I've banged on about remote controls quite a lot because that's one of those things that I do generally always have a look through if there's buckets of remote controls at car boots or something like that or in, in charity shops, rarely. Um, I will always go through remote controls and just pick out the cream of the crop because, again, you pick them up for pennies, you sell them for pounds. They don't always sell quickly uh, because, again, they fall into that you need it rather than you want it kind of uh, dynamic. So be prepared to sit on these things. But again, very easy to post remotes when they when it comes round to uh, actually getting them out there because often they're thin enough. Certainly in the UK, they're thin enough to be able to go for a large letter. Uh, so that kind of saves on your postage and stuff as well. And that'll probably be the case with this TV camera, to be honest with you as well. It's nice and slim. So by the time I've got that in a little narrow box with a bit of bubble wrap in it, I think that'll probably go for a large letter to post. So that's kind of a nice, uh, easy one to deal with logistically. And it should sell, I would think, relatively quickly. Um, I haven't fully checked into these on eBay yet um, to see what the sort of sell-through rate is on them or anything along those sort of lines. But I do think uh, being a Samsung smart TV camera, uh, I think Samsung massively popular smart TVs, uh, Samsung and LG, I think are probably some of the most popular ones for the smart TVs out there. And uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to have any trouble moving that one at all. So that was a little uh, peripheral item there. Let's just go in through some uh, a few boxed pairs of shoes really quickly. These are all broadly similar, so I'll just kind of flash them up to the screen and say this is what this is, and I'll put them back. Uh, but these are Riker anti-stress shoes. Now, I've done quite well with Riker boots in the past, uh, and I think another pair of Riker shoes that I've sold previously. Um, but this is kind of one of their signature uh, ranges of the anti-stress shoes. So it's comfort footwear, uh, the idea being something that you can just wear all day and then, you know, when it comes to taking them off, you don't even feel like you've had them on kind of thing. Uh, so we've got uh, ladies, sort of Mary Jane type, uh, with the perforated toe box there. Uh, really nice condition on these. Little tiny bit of wear just to the... We knock the camera while I'm at it. Little tiny bit of wear just to the corner of the heel there. But really nothing significant at all. Let's turn that camera back. Uh, really nothing significant at all. And aside from that, they do look pretty well new. Uh, and as I say, got the box for those. So that's a nice start on those. 
Then we've got another pair of Riker Anti-Stress. These are even better condition still. I think these have actually got a little bit of the remnant of the sticker from the bottom uh, of the shoe on those as well. So that really does suggest that they've hardly been worn because uh, quite often that would be discoloured or have come off completely. These are more like a little suede, uh, suede pump with the heel. And I think actually, yeah, so that's got the original retail price on the box there as well. So these sell for about £55 new. So that kind of gives you an idea of my uh, price point for them, selling them second hand. And then the last pair of Riker Anti-Stress are these kind of funky uh, sort of loafer with a bit of a wedge to them. Uh, and if the camera's picking that up properly, yeah, just about there, it's kind of got a, um, a bit of rainbow coloration to this fake snakeskin pattern. So those are a little bit different as well. So it's three pairs of boxed Riker anti-stress. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be the anti-stress shoes. Excuse me, I've got hiccups. Doesn't have to be necessarily the uh, anti-stress shoes. Riker is a good brand across the board. Uh, they do sell a lot of other leather wear as well. So like accessories like gloves and stuff. So definitely look out for the, uh, the name Riker. Uh, always a good sort of hallmark of quality. And while we're on that subject, uh, Hotter. These are a British brand, and again, uh, the idea being very much comfort footwear. Uh, if you feel the soles on these shoes and stuff like that, they're really sort of, they're firm on the one hand, so you kind of know that they're going to support. But when you sort of push your thumb into them, you can kind of feel how soft it is as well at the same time. So they're supportive, but at the same time, really nicely cushioned. And again, this is just like a little slip on uh, pump with the bow on the toe. So the hotter ones, they're reasonably expensive to buy new as well, and uh, there's no price on these, but uh, again, in the box, so that always helps. Last pair of boxed footwear I've got there, uh, we've got some Skechers, uh, and these are Skechers on the go uh, boat shoes. A little, uh, little bit dirty underneath, but no sort of significant wear to them, so I'll give those a good clean up and we'll get those looking uh, brand spanking new. Uh, boat shoes as a style are not something that I've personally sold before. I do have another pair listed that I've had for a little while by Sperry. Um, the boat shoes that I have seen do particularly well are the Timberland leather ones. If you can pick up the Timberland leather boat shoes, check them out on eBay uh, before you do so. But just, just search Timberland leather boat shoe and you'll find loads of soles for them in all kinds of conditions as well. It almost seems to the point that condition it almost doesn't matter so much with the Timberland boat shoes. Uh, not had any personal experience of selling them, so don't hold me to that necessarily. But from looking at the sold items on eBay, definitely, uh, you know, they, they are something that seems to sell in all sorts of conditions. Of course, condition will affect price, uh, but you probably will still sell them even if they're not necessarily that great. So that's the Timberland ones. Not tried these Skechers ones before, uh, but they were in the same shop that I got all of the other boxed shoes from. So I thought, why not? I've sold a few pairs of Skechers before because uh, Joe, my wife, likes Skechers, and when she's finished with a pair, um, we'll quite often sell her ones on eBay and we've sold a few pairs that she's had in the past that she's never even worn as well. So I've got history selling the brand. Um, I've got history with the brand in terms of my wife likes them. So I kind of know them a little bit from that respect as well. I know how popular they are. And as I say, the boat shoe uh, is, is kind of semi-popular style, but in other manufacturers. So let's see how they go in uh, Skechers. That's the word. So that's those. That's the box shoes couple of other little peripheral items as I touched on a moment ago there remotes uh, we've got a Samsung uh, TV remote there that one is a uh, BN59 model remote which is compatible with a lot of their smart TVs might even bundle that with the camera possibly I don't know we'll see uh, and then the other one I've got there is a HP uh, media center remote uh, these both cost sort of like 50p uh, territory and again, they're going to go into the sort of £10 plus sort of, I think that one actually might be about seven or eight. So, you know, £8 plus, uh, but for something that you've only paid like 50p for, it's a good return. Again, don't always sell straight away because they are very much the epitome of people will buy them when they need them. There's no real or oh, craving a new remote or anything like that. So, yeah, remotes, very good. I've talked about them at length in a lot of other videos, so I'm not going to sort of labour the point too much on those today. Now I'm going to pause this video for a minute while I go for a wee. And we're back. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, diabetes is a bit of a bitch, and when you got to go, you got to go sometimes. So, uh, back to items. I picked up a bunch of mugs. Uh, this box represents a few of them. 
uh, but I've got a ton more as well. Um, I picked up this massive selection of mugs from a local charity shop before, actually this one's before Christmas, blimey, this wasn't even a January one. Um, but basically what they were doing, they were trying to clear a load of space for Christmas stock. So while these mugs were all priced at sort of 50p to a pound each, um, I got a bunch of them, all the ones in this box, uh, plus a few more besides, and I paid four quid for the lot. So it was a really good, uh, really good pick up those, and uh, should make a reasonably good return on them as well. So we've got, uh, I'll show you a few of the highlights and I'll blast through them relatively quickly. We've got this vintage, uh, what is it, 1990, this one? Dated on the side there. It's the 1990s uh, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles rather than Ninja Turtles. So it's British because we called them Hero Turtles rather than Ninja Turtles because people thought Ninja was scary um, or violent in some way. So Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles uh, Raphael mug. So that's a vintage 90s one. We've got a France 98 World Cup mug there from the uh, football tournament. Then I've got sets of uh, Warner Brothers. Absolutely love Warner Brothers, man. I'm a, I'm a total Warner Brothers nut. I, I'm never really got on with Disney, particularly Warner Brothers was definitely uh, my thing growing up. These are all sort of circa ninety five to ninety seven. This one's a ninety seven example, and these are all made uh, by sort of various Staffordshire tableware companies as well. So they're good quality mugs. You know, they're not like your, your vintage Staffordshire stuff, like the old uh, blue and white Ironstone and whatnot. But you know, this one uh, this one's made there. This one is actually made by Staffordshire Tableware, uh, and then I've got a few others that are from like uh, Kilncraft as well, which is another Staffordshire brand, uh, including that one there, which is Dennis the Menace, uh, one from the Beano. So I've got a set of these different uh, Warner Brothers ones, I've also got a set of various different Disney ones, which again are all made by Kilncraft, and these will probably all get bundled up into sort of a Warner Brothers bundle, a Disney bundle. I'll probably do the Tur Turtles one separately, and I'll probably do the World Cup one separately, just because I don't really have anything to bundle them up with, uh, but I'll certainly bundle up the other uh, branded mugs. Um, Price-wise, not really 100% sure, but like I say, I paid four quid for the whole lot, so there's absolutely no way I'm going to lose on those, unless I decide to sort of throw them down the stairs or something, in which case it's a total loss, but hopefully we're not going to do anything like that. Uh, so yeah, that's some mugs. A uh, couple of... Let's see if I can actually get one of these on camera just to show you. Uh, typewriters. I absolutely love typewriters, and um, you've probably, if you've seen any of my other videos previously, you will see that I've sold a few uh, electric typewriters and also mechanical typewriters. I've picked up a couple of mechanical ones here. I think this is the only one that's going to fit on the camera though, because the other one's massive. Uh, this one is the uh, Olivetti Lettera 23, uh, vintage mechanical typewriter. Absolutely lovely condition on this one. It's still got most of the plastic on the uh, carriage return handle there as well. Most of the original rubber grip on there. It's also got a little cleaning kit just in this red pouch. Uh, and then these envelopes and stuff in the back here. You've got carbon paper, uh, nice typist paper and stuff like that as well. So this is a really nice original complete set. Um, and that is, you know, a hundred quid plus typewriter all day for that one. Um, I'll have to double check exactly on the price wise uh, for it but they are certainly 100 quid plus all day uh, from previous experience of selling these and similar ones. So that's a really cool one. I've also got a silver reed one there as well which is a little bit later uh, and not quite as uh, good of a sort of brand. Um, I don't even know if this is going to fit in the frame. It's massive. It's still a mechanical it's in the hard plastic case rather than the leatherette one there. Let's see if I can get this on the camera really quickly. That is the Silver Reed 500. Again, absolutely superb condition. I can hear my own voice echoing off the lid, so let's close that now without dropping my fingers in it. Um, yeah, the Silver Reed 500, absolutely great condition uh, in the hard case there as well. It's not going to be as much money as the little Olivetti there, uh, just because the brand isn't quite as prestigious, uh, but should still do quite well with that one as well. So these old kind of obsolete, if you like, uh, bits of office equipment and stuff like that, they absolutely have a place in modern society on several levels. Um, one, there are just people who really like 
the analog feel of a typewriter uh, versus the kind of no feedback you really get from a keyboard or anything like that. Um, companies that use uh, that, that type shipping orders and stuff like that quite often will do it on a typewriter because they're given a pre-printed form that they need to fill out quickly. So rather than scan that into a PC, type it up on the PC, print it off again, and then attach it to the sh to the uh, shipment, they'll just take the blank shipping order, stick it in a typewriter, type it up, and then it's done straight away. Uh, also, obviously, people are concerned about privacy and stuff like that. Certainly still use typewriters and things because there's no paper trail. There's no sort of, you know, back up to the cloud or anything along those sort of lines. So there's a lot of different reasons why people still like using typewriters. I do think nostalgia um, is a big one. Um, but certainly, like I say, there are other reasons there as well. Uh, I've done well with every typewriter that I've ever sold. Um, definitely look into brands of them uh, because some of them can look a lot better than they actually are. And you do find sometimes that there are uh, semi-modern, not, not totally modern, still sort of 90s, 80s, 90s models um, that look a lot older than they actually are. And you find when you pick them up and stuff like that, that components that would be metal on something like this uh, are plastic on the newer ones and they just don't have that feel of quality there so uh, do look out for typewriters always keep them in the back of your mind but also be aware that some shops and stuff like that are starting to get a little bit wise to them as well now so the prices are going up that little bit unfortunately uh, when you're picking them up but they are still worth looking at definitely so it's a couple of typewriters uh, right I think now we're just on to clothing yeah, so take you through some clothing bits and pieces that I've picked up over the last month or so as well. Uh, we'll start out with this ladies. This is uh, Levi, as in Levi's jeans. Let's just take that charity shop tag off it. Uh, this is a Levi Strauss and Co. And it is more of a blazer type jacket or a, not quite a suit jacket as such. Let's see if I can do a reasonable-ish job of getting some of that into frame at least. So yeah, um, made by Levi, really nice quality to it. You can, f the feel of quality is apparent straight away. Uh, and the finishing on it's lovely. I think the style of it is really nice as well. And because it's something a little bit less, a uh, little bit less conventional, shall we say for a Levi product, uh, I think it'll do quite well. Uh, I've not looked it up or anything yet to check what it'll do, uh, but it's a nice item. The quality's there, the brand name's there, and uh, the condition's there as well, because it's in superb condition. So, uh, yes, happy days with that one. I'm really chuffed with that as a purchase, to be honest with you. Even when you look at the tags and stuff inside, none of the tags are creased or anything like that. Um, quite often with stuff, when it gets that little bit older, you find that the tags have been screwed up when it's been hung, and it, it all gets creased, but all of these, nice and flat, nice and clean. So, uh, superb condition, really, and a nicely made little blazer type jacket. Next, uh, this is a bit of a kind of throwback to my childhood in a way, my sort of high school years. And it's also quite a good lesson for people that are getting into doing this as well. Um, if you think back to when you were at school, particularly if you're kind of my sort of age and my generation, so if you're in your 30s or 40s now, um, think back to when you were at school and think back to what the quote unquote popular kids were wearing at the time because those sort of things now are the kind of vintage retro things that people are, are wanting to buy again so case in point here is this one this is the soft shell uh kickers overhead uh sort of cagoule uh windbreaker type thing with a big long big wide chest pocket on it this was what pretty much everybody, every kid of uh, my sort of generation wanted back in the day when they were at high school. Uh, it was Kickers, uh, they were the brand for shoes and stuff as well, uh, before the likes of Rockport and stuff like that came out and took over from them. Um, so that's a cool little pickup, something a bit vintagey, uh, a bit retro-y, but not breaking the bank to pick it up either because it was just from a standard charity shop but you know i've not been to any of these uh vintage kilo sales or anything like that that you might have heard other youtubers talk about i know uh car boot chris shout out to car boot chris um he does really well with some of the stuff that he picks up from vintage kilo sales but to be honest with you i couldn't trust myself to go to one because i'd just pick everything up and then realize how much i'd spent when i got home and probably 
you know, I'd, I'd be quite remorseful after the fact. At least with buying stuff that's got a definite price on it, I can look at it and go yes or no straight away. Whereas when it's weight, I'll just pick it all up and go mad. So, uh, yeah, that was a cool little uh, retro sort of vintage item. Uh, and this is another one, actually, in a similar sort of vein. Uh, this is the Adidas. Again, take the charity shop tag off there. This is the Adidas uh, overhead. Uh, in a really, really nice sort of shade of royal blue with the three stripes up the side. Again, that big wide pocket across the chest. And this is the older Adidas stuff uh, with the embroidered tags rather than uh, the printed tags. So what you'll feel on the older Adidas stuff is you can actually physically feel where it's the tag sewn, uh, the, the logo sewn into the tag. Whereas with the newer stuff, it tends to just be screen printed on there and you can't actually feel any raised um aspect to it at all so yeah again that's another cool sort of 90s overhead uh windbreaker type of arrangement uh, that will probably do a little bit better than the kickers one just because it'll have more universal appeal uh you know to, to sort of international buyers and stuff like that whereas kickers i think was pretty was more of just a uk phenomenon although they are an international brand as far as i'm aware um i think they just mostly caught on with us in the uk uh, of certain generations Another cool little item here. Uh, let's again just get the charity shop tag off it. This one I actually picked up in a charity shop that I don't normally buy a lot from. Uh, we have, local to me, we have a Bernardo's vintage charity shop. And quite often the prices are ludicrous in there. I mean, I've often said, you know, you've got to have a second mortgage to go and buy stock from there. Uh, but it seems that the last time I went in there, and a couple of times that I've been in subsequently, actually, the it seems like they're kind of coming back down to planet Earth a little bit. Yes, they are still a little bit dearer than, you know, a run-of-the-mill charity shop, but they are a little bit more specialist as well to a certain extent, and you can find some more unusual items in there. And this is a nice case in point. This is the Quicksilver, uh, sort of a canvas varsity type jacket. Uh, with a really nicely styled Quicksilver logo, actually, as well, rather than the uh, angular kind of more modern Quicksilver logo. I think it's a slightly older iteration of the Quicksilver logo, uh, which I really like, and that's embroidered on the breast as well there. There. Um, I, I like the brand Quicksilver, um, personally, so I like selling it as well. Uh, again, you know, price-wise, not 100% sure what it's going to go for or anything like that, but definitely won't lose the Varsity-style jackets where they've got this, uh, you know, elasticated uh, trim to the hem and to the cuffs and usually to the collar. Um, the other thing that you quite often find with Varsity-type jackets as well is that they'll have uh, flat-coloured sleeves and then uh, a different colour to the actual sort of uh, tunic part, if you like, of the coat. Um, so those are all sort of indicators of the varsity style uh, but really they're the sort of American university jackets and sporting jackets and stuff like that uh, if you think like Marty McFly in uh, Back to the Future and stuff he wore a varsity type jacket the style's really popular at the moment uh, and whether it is one for a sports team or whether it's just kind of a, a, a generic branded one or a designer branded one, they are really popular at the moment varsity jackets so something that's definitely worth looking out for uh, in themselves and that one's a really cool one. Uh, next, this one is, again, I'll take the charity shop tag off it. I'm very well detagging these items. This one is a Falmer denim jacket, which has been uh, rebranded for Lollapalooza Music Festival uh, 2019 in Santiago, Chile. Now, what they've done, and from what I can tell looking at other ones, this seems to be what Lollapalooza do every year. They will buy branded jackets from, you know, X company, and they will uh, re then rebrand those jackets with their own patches and their own labels and stuff as well. So while this is a Falmer denim jacket, as you can see by the buttons, is that even going to focus? Probably not, because it's bobbins. Uh, but this is a Falmer denim jacket originally. Uh, but what you'll find is just down on the flank there, you've got the Lollapalooza patch official product. And also in the collar, you've got the official Lollapalooza uh, tag there as well. On the back, it's got the Lollapalooza Santiago logo for 26, uh, 2019. And on the front, it's got a little patch on the breast as well. Now, uh, 
denim jackets again are a really popular thing and of course definitely look out for the big name brands like your Levi ones and stuff like that Wrangler and um, they can do really well uh, but do don't pass over things like this and also don't pass over jackets that people have maybe sewn patches onto as well uh, particularly if you think about sort of people that go to a lot of gigs again this goes back to kind of classic rock music and stuff mainly but if you look at a lot of uh, older bands and stuff that are still touring today, so we'll take the example, I don't think they are still touring now, but uh, if we take the example of somebody like Status Quo, it is not unusual for you to find, potentially, um, a denim jacket that's had a load of different Status Quo patches sewn to it. And uh, if you find something like that, don't discount it, even if it's not necessarily a branded jacket, because fans of the band will still collect it for the patches. So definitely look out for stuff like that as well. Uh, but this one I picked up because of the Lollapalooza branding, uh, which is a big international music festival. This is specifically uh, Lollapalooza Chile rather than the mainland US one. Um, so this should do quite well. Comps, uh, that's completed listings, sold listings on eBay. Similar things uh, to this sort of nature generally sold between about 70 and 80 pounds uh, but this exact one for 2019 Santiago is not on there so I'm gonna to have to do a little bit more research on that one before I list it but I think it stands to do particularly well next we've got Barber this is the Barber uh, Gents Boson Gili is the name of the model and if you're ever wondering where to find model names on Barber clothing Generally, if you go into the inside pocket, most barber stuff has an inside pocket. And generally, if you go into there, you will find a label which has the washing instructions and stuff on there. But the main thing you're looking for is where's the camera? There we go. So you should be able to see that says Barber uh, Boson Gilet, retail Boson Gilet. So that's where to find the model names on barber stuff. Um, it's not always in just the one inside pocket sometimes it's in you know like a, a little obscure pocket somewhere as well but definitely check internally because they've generally most of the time they will have that uh, model name put in there so this is a nice quilted gilet again we'll take the charity shop tag off it um, it's a nice quilted gilet popular style from a really popular brand uh, and a brand that is internationally renowned um, Make, makers of country wear, uh, very popular with people who are into equestrian stuff, so horse riding, uh, show jumping and stuff like that. It's kind of where it found its fame, uh, but it's also branched out now as a brand into being you know, a fashion brand, but still very sort of high quality stuff. Now, a great indicator of quality on any item, regardless of what it is, whether it's you know clothing, food, cars, whatever, any product out there, a great indicator of quality, certainly if it's come from a UK company, is the Royal Warrant. Now the Royal Warrants look like this. Let me see if I can get them on camera properly. And that is these little crests that you see just above the barber name there. Now those three crests, the one on the left uh, is by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. The middle one is by appointment to uh, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. And then you've got by appointment to His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. So what this means, uh, if a brand is used by the royal family or used in a royal household, they can apply for royal warrant status, which basically means they're allowed to put on their products that this is used by the royal family or this is used by a royal household. Um, it obviously adds prestige to the brand, but of course the royal family aren't going to use crap either. So from the point of view of us as resellers uh, or us selling anything online, uh, if it's got a royal warrant on it, it's good enough for the royal family. So it's good enough for your eBay customers. Definitely. Now with Barber, you've always got the name straight away. So you've got the reputation of the brand. Uh, you will quite often pay up for it because like I say, it is a brand with a reputation. So the name is known out on the marketplace. The name is known in charity shops. It's known by people that are selling it on car boots. So you can often end up paying up a little bit more for barber stuff, but don't let that put you off. As long as you've done your homework and you're paying the right sort of money for the right sort of product, you will make money on barber stuff unquestionably. Same goes for sort of Doc Martin boots. Quite often you'll pay up for Doc Martins, but you'll still make money on them if you know what you're looking at and you're shrewd with it. Um, so that one's the Barber Boson Gilet, which is a nice big size as well, which should help sell it. Uh, 
you know, extreme sizes I find do quite well. So like really big sizes, really small sizes that you can't always necessarily walk into the shops and buy. I tend to have quite good experiences of selling those, to be honest with you. Next item, we've got a ladies. Uh, this is by uh, Barney's, a US brand. Uh, this is a ladies sort of leather um distressed vintage style look to it uh flying jacket with the furry color so it's like a world war ii pilot's bomber jacket almost uh it's a really soft leather really buttery smooth leather and you've got the uh as well as the fur trim on the collar you've got the kind of fake sheepy sheepskin type lining as well i don't know if it is fake actually i need to check that because it probably isn't given that this is uh you know, leather, it's, they're probably not too bothered about using the real stuff on it, so I'll just double check that as well. Um, but yeah, again, a really nice style. Uh, even, what I find with leather, leather wear stuff, even if you haven't necessarily got the brand name there, you can sometimes sell it just based on the quality and the style of it. So, you know, irrespective of whether it's, you know, some sort of, uh, for example, a brand that you pick up in Spain that you can't get in the UK and they're only a small brand in Spain or something like that. I say Spain because they make a lot of leather wear out there. Um, you know, if it's some sort of cottage industry brand that, that, that sells in Spain, even though the name isn't necessarily known throughout the world, the quality will be and the style will be. So if the style's right, the quality's right, don't be afraid to pick these things up and check them out because leather leather products, leather jackets and stuff like that, they're fairly universally uh, appealing. So that's a nice, cool ladies one. Then we've got a couple of, it's one of my favourite brands, uh, both to sort of use and to resell. This is Heli Hansen we're going into now. Uh, Heli Hansen, famous for uh, sailing wear. That's where they kind of made their reputation. Uh, but that has latterly sort of progressed into them doing a lot of uh, mountaineering stuff, outdoor wear, walking wear, and stuff like that as well. And they also have a bit of a reputation as being a, um, a sort of appealing fashion brand. A little bit the same sort of way as the North Face, but not to the same extent. Um, Heli Hansen seems to have been able to hang on to their uh, professional audience a lot more than I think the North Face perhaps have, where because the North Face has become such a big fashion brand, a lot of the sort of professionals are kind of going, hmm, you know, every kid on the block's wearing North Face. Now, I don't want people to think I'm some kid. Um, so the likes of Heli Hansen, although, yes, they do have a bit of a fashion following as well. I think the, the professionals have kind of stuck with them as a brand a little bit more than perhaps something like North Face. But that's just opinion purely uh, and simply there's no sort of there's nothing to back that up uh, so what we got in terms of the coat well we've got a gents uh blue two-tone blue so you've got the darker blue at the top with the lighter blue underneath and it's a two-tone blue puffer jacket in a ripstop nylon so let's see if we can get this ripstop to focus on the camera there probably not strike on the darker bit uh not typically the darker bit's not ripstop uh but yeah ripstop nylon now yeah, you can't really see it on the camera. Ripstop nylon has a grid woven into the material. And you can see it close up when you look at a piece of ripstop nylon. The idea of that grid is that if uh, the, the, the garment gets a little puncture hole in it or anything like that, the grid lines run uh, opposite in opposite directions to the actual... Uh, what's the word is it weft i think they, they run in the opposite direction to the weft of the material so what happens there is with i'm just sitting here at the camera doing that i've just realized um what happens there when you've got that grid if you look at the, the middle square the middle sort of area of my fingers here if there was a puncture to happen in that area i'm sitting there doing that again that's really bad isn't it um if there was a puncture to happen in the middle of that square, the idea is it shouldn't run beyond that square that the, the, the rip starts in. Sorry, I was just laughing at the fact that I'm sitting there just giving you the Vs. Do apologise, guys. Nothing personal. And I realise it's only really offensive in the UK anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, so the ripstop stuff, you'll find that on a lot of outdoor gear. You'll find it even on uh, on clothing, certainly, but you'll also find it on things like tents and bags and stuff like that as well. It's a really kind of popular uh, technology uh, or a really popular 
um, feature is probably a better word on uh, outdoor gear. So that's the ripstop nylon. Uh, the other factor of this that makes it a really good coat uh, is that it's down filled. So it's feather and down rather than being a uh, synthetic filling. Nothing wrong with synthetic fill whatsoever, uh, but feather and down certainly is a, is a much more uh, efficient insulator. It's also can be lighter weight as well, depending on the type of down that's used. Uh, and it is more expensive to buy. It is more of a premium product. So Although, yeah, you'll find a lot of stuff that's uh, finished with a uh, synthetic fill, the down stuff and the feather stuff is definitely the stuff to really look out for. Um, what you then also want to look out for is the ratio of feather to down. Down is uh, the finer sort of, if you like, base layer feathering of a bird, and that is a very, very efficient insulator, but there's so much less of it uh, for every time they kind of take it from a bird. Um, so down is more expensive than feather. So often feather is used to kind of keep the, the same sort of aesthetic and the same sort of feel, but not have to use as much down in the blend. So the more, basically the more down heavy the blend, the better. So in the case of this, uh, this one is 40% down and 60% feather. So it's not an amazing ratio particularly you know i would rather it was the other way around 60 percent down 40 percent feather uh but it's a slightly older jacket as well so you know it's it's going to do it will do well because the style is right uh the color combination is right the condition's superb the uh brand is good and uh, as i say it's down filled down and feather regardless so that'll do well that one I think the last down and feather Heli Hansen that I sold, I sold for about 120 quid. It wasn't the same as that one, so I'll have to check that one just to make sure it kind of falls in the same sort of realms as the other one that I sold did. Uh, but yeah, just for a guide price, Heli Hansen, great brand. And with that, I've got a ladies one as well. This is obviously uh, the magenta one. Uh, slightly more modern, this one, than the other one that you just saw. Uh, this has got more of the... Uh, the slightly more stylized modern Heli Hansen logo, um, which tends to be much more uh, subtle on the newer stuff than it was on the older stuff. The, the, when you look at the uh, branding on, yeah, you know, the branding on that one, although it's only a small tab at the bottom, it's still much more, uh, being the black and white against the blue jacket, it's much more in your face than the sort of almost stealthed on uh i can't even find it on the camera now than the than the almost sort of stealthy uh one on the modern stuff not really know why i'm telling you that it's just kind of an interesting fact uh so this one again is down and feather filled uh and this one is much more like the sort of ratio that i was talking about before i think this one is uh yeah this one is 75 percent down and 25 percent feather um so this will have been quite an expensive coat to have bought new and when i research it i will find out exactly how much it was to buy it new because i don't think it's that old uh it's a really nice style as well rather than being the sort of straight across uh traditional stitch of the puffer jacket this has got the diagonals on it uh and that runs asymmetrically as well around the the flanks there so you've got it running in one direction down the breast then down the side it runs the other way and then down the back it runs the other way again so it's kind of a bit asymmetric in that sense as well so that's a really nice jacket that one with the hidden hood and then when you've got the hood uh rolled away you should be able to have yeah there you go when the hood's rolled away you've got a little embroidered a uh, bit of branding on the, the back of the collar as well. So that's another really cool jacket uh, and one that I think will do quite well when it comes to being listed. Uh, right, I'm down to the last few items now. Uh, these I actually picked up yesterday. And as I was saying before, I don't pick up a lot of Converse because I tend to find that they go uh, cheap enough in discount stores. But I'll always look at them. Whenever I see them out and about, I will always look at Converse trainers. Uh, and this is a great case in point as to why it is worth looking at them. Because although whatever misconceptions you might have about them to begin with, they can do well in certain uh, situations. So this one I picked up purely because it's a bit different. This is the classic um, Chuck Taylor high top uh, style cut with the, the Converse logo uh, embossed in the leather there. But as you can see, uh, they're studded. 
and these are full leather as well. Uh, so with a lot of these Chuck Taylors, you'll find that they're either part canvas or part suede and stuff like that. I find those don't seem to sell for as much money um, as the full leather ones, but this being full leather and having the studs and having that bit of leopard print detail down the back as well really attracted me to picking them up and buying them. Uh, condition was good too. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of wear to the soles there on those. They are a bit dirty. They need a good clean. And another thing to always watch out for with Converse trainers, as anybody who's probably ever worn them will tell you, is the heels. What happens over time is this part of the heel of the midsole sort of delaminates from the main sole. And you tend to find that that all-star plaque there starts to get screwed up. And uh, I would never buy a pair of Converse if they're starting to show that sort of heel wear. Because once it starts, it's as to my knowledge, it's irreversible and it just knackers the shoes eventually. So best to find stuff that doesn't have that kind of wear uh, starting on it anyway, which these ones don't. And they're also sort of lined uh, leopard print inside as well. So I picked those up because they're a little bit different and they were also reasonably cheap for what they were. Um, again, not looked them up yet to sort of price them for retail, but that sort of explains a little bit more my mentality around how I pick up Converse shoes and why I don't just pick up every pair of Converse that I ever see. Last few items are a few more mugs. These haven't come out of the big job lot of mugs. These are just ones that I've selected and picked up in other stores and stuff over time. Uh, tell a lie, actually, one of them did come out of the bundle. It was this one, uh, which was the Kilncraft again. And this is a 1992 uh, Super Mario mug. So there's Mario uh, sleeping, dreaming of his princess and his mushrooms. That mushroom is really not a Mario mushroom, though, is it? Come on, that is not like... You know that that is a magic mushroom. That's not <laughs> that's not out of the realms of the kind of Mario imagery. Look, there's the Mario image. You know the Mario style mushrooms. What's that one all about? Anywho, uh, yeah. So he's dreaming about you know like the the moon and the power blocks and stuff like that there as well. So that's kind of a cool little gaming mug, little retro one, and it is uh, officially licensed Nintendo as well. So it's not just like some hooky one. So that's quite a cool one. And then uh, following the same sort of theme, this has been used, it is, it is a used item, but uh, it's got its original box with it there. And this one is a colour changing uh, Nintendo Game Boy mug. And when you've got a hot drink in there, the screen there changes colour and shows like a scene from sort of a Mario game or something like that on there. Uh, but again, another cool little sort of retro gaming uh, type of uh, accessory. This was made in 2016 and it's by Paladone who make a lot of this type of uh, sort of tie-in promotional products and stuff like that as well. So in these types of things, um, if you ever see Paladone on them, you can generally be pretty certain that they are uh, officially licensed, so uh, makes for easier selling. Again, these did not cost a lot. I don't think I've really paid more than a quid for any of these mugs, and they'll generally go for pretty good money, uh, particularly stuff like gaming-related and things like that as well. Speaking of gaming-related, this is probably my favourite gaming-related mug that I picked up. I did pay £2 for this one, so I paid up a little bit. But again, it's another Paladone one. Uh, it's got the tag on it, original tag, and it's an official PlayStation uh, controller mug. So you've got the old PSX Mark One PlayStation uh, controller as the handle there. And then, of course, PlayStation's logo on the front and the triangle square circle and X on the back. So that is such a cool item. I really like that one. Um, again, I haven't looked up what it's going to go for, but it is new with tags. It's not been used or anything. So uh, I don't think that's going to sit around for too long, especially with all the hype coming around PlayStation 5 and stuff like that as well. So that's that one. Uh... I've shown you the Mario one. This one, uh, these are another one to look out for in general. This is a little bit of a bolo, if you like. Be on the lookout. I don't know why we use police, American police terminology when we're talking about items to look for on resale, but bolo. Um, these are Starbucks location mugs. So a lot of major cities and stuff across the world have a, a mug produced by Starbucks, but for their sale in their branches. They are quite collectible. And people all over the world pick them up when they go on holiday and stuff like that. And, and there are, you know, just dedicated collectors of some of these Starbucks location mugs. Some of them are crazy money. And off the top of my head, I can't remember which ones go for crazy money, to be perfectly honest with you. But just look into Starbucks location mugs and you'll soon, soon start to realize which ones are the ones that really command massive money. And which ones do pretty well because there aren't any 
to my experience or to my knowledge that don't make profit um or that certainly that don't make decent money um so this one is from bonn in germany and you've got the uh what is that usually says on there what it is it's 2013 i'll give you that uh yeah it doesn't actually say what the landmark is, but it's obviously a famous landmark to Bonn. I feel like I should know that, because I think that's where my parents went on their honeymoon, to be honest with you, before I was born. So I feel like I should know more about Bonn than I do. But regardless, uh, Starbucks locations mug. Cool little uh, thing to look out for and pick up. And the last mug is this one. Now this, to all intents and purposes, is a plain white or cream ceramic mug. Now, when you look underneath... This mug is signed, it says copyright Spademan, and that is a lady called Sarah Spademan, who uh, is an American artist and a ceramic artist, and she is uh, primarily trades, from what I can see these days, primarily trades on Etsy. Um, the cool thing about this mug, and the thing that just takes it from being this white cream ceramic mug that doesn't really look anything special, is when you look inside, you got a little doggy uh, sat in there. It is a fully 3D, uh, you know, realised ceramic dog in there. This cup isn't stained, I should point out. Um, when you look at this cup and any of the other ones that uh, Sarah Spademan's selling currently on Etsy, they all have a glaze inside them uh, that comes up in sort of a gradient. So in the case of this one, it's yellow towards the bottom of the cup and it fades into the white as it goes up. And then you've just got the little uh, sort of black Labrador type puppy in there. Uh, drinking half your brew, I guess. To be honest, yeah. To be honest, like, as a, as an actual you know drinking cup, I can't imagine it being great because that is taking up half of the brew space. But as a novelty item, it's really really cool. And these, from what I've seen on uh, completed listings on eBay, they sell fairly consistently for sort of twenty to twenty five pounds, and some of them even a little bit more when she's done a, a limited edition one. Um, so again, just to say that I picked up most of these mugs for a pound. Uh, if if that in most cases I think the dearest one there was the PlayStation mug that I paid two pounds for so you know some of these mugs definitely worth looking out for always look out for any sort of ceramics and pottery as well if it is signed you can quite often find uh, information about the artist and stuff like that uh, either before you buy it or after the fact so yeah that's a cool little item as well and that is really everything i've got to show you there for today guys and that was just a nice little quick catch-up video uh, so normal service will be resumed soon and i'll get cracking on the uh, sales roundup videos we'll get those put out and uh, you can see how good uh december was and january wasn't too bad either to be fair what i found last year uh when i started january 2019 trade fell off a cliff for me and i was really worried that it was going to be a case of all right i need to go back and get a job again uh but managed to get through it but this year um the trade has dropped off certainly from what it was at Christmas because obviously you're always going to be that bit busier at Christmas but it's kind of only dropped off back to normal levels it's not gone and fallen off a cliff so I'm pretty happy about that to be honest with you um, so we'll get some sales roundup videos out soon as well as I say I'm going to do a little bit of experimentation with my laptop and see if it's worth me uh, using that to go live because I can't go live on my phone yet I don't have a thousand subscribers excuse me um, but as soon as I do, I'll be able to go live on my mobile and stuff as well, so that'll be quite cool. Uh, but yeah, I think that's everything for today, guys. So thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please feel free to leave me a thumbs up and a like down below. Uh, if you didn't enjoy the video, similarly, by all means, leave a thumbs down, but please don't just thumb and run. Uh, let me know what you did and didn't like and I will in the comment section down below, and I will try and sort of tailor any future comments. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll try and tailor any future content to be a little bit more palatable for everybody. Um... If you do want to keep watching my videos, please feel free to subscribe and do give the bell icon in the corner there a little tickle and that will notify you as soon as any new videos are uploaded or any live streams or anything like that start as well. But otherwise, guys, that's everything for today. Thank you so much for joining me and giving me your time. And uh, any comments, questions, don't forget to, uh, you know, you can uh, find me over on Instagram and stuff as well now. Otherwise, guys, have a great day and I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.